Sometimes we get an impression that it's all doom and gloom, that absolutely nothing's happening. Um, that's both complacent and wrong. Wherever you look, there are things happening at the local level that if they were identified and supported by government, could rapidly accelerate the change to a more sustainable way of doing things. It could be more vibrant and diverse and abundant and people working closer to home, spending more time with their families, breathing cleaner air, eating better food. There is a constant pressure on people to have bigger, better, more. But of course in the end, what does it bring us? It doesn't bring us happiness. Every year since the end of World War II, one of the big polling firms has asked Americans, are you happy with your life? The number of Americans who say, yes, I'm very happy with my life, the percentage peaks in 1956 and goes slowly but steadily downhill ever since. That's interesting because in that same 50 years, we've gotten immeasurably richer. We have three times as much stuff. Globalization is the most powerful force for change in the world today. It's the rapid expansion of a process that started about 500 years ago. At that time, Europeans conquered and colonized much of the world. They dismantled self-reliant economies and enslaved their populations forcing them to work in mines, cotton fields and tea plantations. In the mid-20th century, colonialism gave way to a more subtle form of enslavement, debt. Shackled by so-called aid packages and crippling loans, nation after nation fell deeper into poverty, making it easier for corporations and financial institutions the successors of the colonial merchants to extract money, resources and cheap labour. Today, those transnational businesses have grown so large and powerful that they effectively control governments, dictate economic policy and shape people's opinions and world views. Yet the push for growth through global trade in both goods and finance continues. In order to compete, the big corporations are demanding ever more deregulation, still further globalization. It's an agenda that has major implications for both ecosystems and people around the world. The stresses on the average household have increased enormously. Their jobs are much more demanding, more travel, more access at any time. It's corporations who are raising our children. Who's driving the food choices of children? Who's driving the entertainment choices of children? Our children don't want to speak their languages anymore. They no longer want to be associated with their own culture. It's cool to wear designer jeans. It's cool to eat at McDonald's. Encouraging consumerism threatens the ecological fabric of the entire planet. Natural resources are already stretched to breaking point by population pressures. And yet, we have an economic system that encourages each and every one of us to consume more and more and more. It's a terrific onslaught of ma marketing, merchandising. 
advertising, brainwashing. So we are on a big consumptive splurge. The consumer culture that globalization promotes is increasingly urban. The moment a person moves into the city, the energy use shoots up, the water use shoots up, the infrastructure to run a city per capita is much bigger than the infrastructure to produce a high quality of life in a village. You cannot have an infinite growth on a finite plane. No matter how you dress it up, the whole thing stares at you in the face. There isn't enough resources for growth. The very logic of globalization requires that goods travel ever longer distances from producer to consumer. Because of hidden subsidies and skewed regulations, food from the other side of the world tends to cost less than food from a mile away. In the UK, butter from New Zealand costs significantly less than butter from the farm down the road. We often hear about efficiencies of scale, but actually the truth is what we've developed today is a system that could not be more wasteful. We have English apples flown to South Africa to be waxed, flown back again to be sold to consumers. The whole process involves incredible quantities of waste. A series of treaties, new ones almost every year, promote economic growth through international trade. As a consequence, countries today routinely import and export nearly identical quantities of identical products. Every day of the year, grain, meat, live animals, canned goods, and a whole range of manufactured products, not to mention waste, even used batteries, crisscross the planet. All of this at a time when rising CO2 emissions are threatening our very survival. The global economy has become a casino and we're all potential losers. One major casualty is our jobs. Corporate mergers, takeovers, relocation to lower wage countries threaten the livelihood of virtually all of us. Accountants, assembly workers, even CEOs. And when we retire, it gets no better. As we've seen recently, pension funds are at the mercy of uncontrolled speculation. When people are pushed off the land into crowded cities, members of diverse ethnic and religious groups are forced into intense competition for the few available jobs. Differences that were once accepted become a source of fear, fundamentalism, and conflict. Globalization, which is creating the gap between the rich and poor, is directly affecting the survival of certain people, a lot of people. You destroy language, you destroy the roots of who you are, you destroy the history and you become nobody in the world. Globalization with its homogenous way of looking at the world and that we must have one world view is extremely dangerous. There are billions and billions of dollars being poured into continuing business as usual. Whether that's subsidizing fossil fuels, whether it's subsidizing huge monocultures, whether it's giving corporate welfare to some of the already largest and most powerful corporations around. At the global level, regulations are being increasingly stripped away with the effect that transnational corporations and banks are free to operate across the entire planet. Meanwhile, at the national level, there's ever more red tape and bureaucracy. This places an unfair, disproportionate burden on small and medium-sized businesses. Only with a full-cost accounting system will we begin to understand 
that goods that are shipped from 10,000 miles away are actually far more expensive than goods produced locally. If you look at the current system, we're seeing the distance between production and consumption continue to increase. We're seeing the distance between people and power continue to increase. I think economic globalization is, is responsible for that. It's increasing those trends. And the obvious answer for me is the opposite, and that is economic localization. We've got to begin localizing. There is only one economics that will make sense. It is local economics, everywhere. Localization is a systemic, far-reaching alternative to corporate capitalism. Fundamentally, it's about reducing the scale of economic activity. That doesn't mean eliminating international trade or striving for some kind of absolute self-reliance. It's simply about creating more accountable and more sustainable economies by producing what we need closer to home. At a policy level, the first step is to start the process of bringing transnational corporations under democratic control. We need to focus on three key mechanisms that governments use to shape the economy. What they choose to regulate, both at the national level and internationally through trade treaties. What they choose to tax and what they choose to subsidize. At the moment, governments of every political color are using these mechanisms to favor the big and the global. If there's to be any chance of averting further social and environmental breakdown, we need to level the playing field. If, for example, a fraction of the subsidies that have gone into nuclear power or fossil fuels were to go into renewable energies. If a fraction of the subsidies that have gone into the whole infrastructure that supports the private car was to go into mass transit systems, it's incredible what we could achieve. When the economy is operating on a more human scale, it becomes easier for us to see the impact of our choices. We can see if the environment has been polluted with chemicals or if workers have been exploited. And so business becomes much more accountable. One of the most important studies that we have on the effects of local business compared the impacts of $100 spent at a local bookstore versus $100 spent at a chain. $100 spent at the local bookstore left $45 in the local economy. $100 spent at the chain left $13. So you get three times the income effects, three times the jobs, three times the tax proceeds for local governments. There are movements to localize not only business, but banking and finance as well. One of the things we have to do is to put finance back into its box. So the re-regulation of the banking sector is vital. Breaking up banks that are too big to fail, or was called too big to fail. Separating speculative functions from high street, main street, retail functions of banking so that money is our, becomes our servant once more rather than our master. The financial crisis has actually given us a reminder that local banking and local pensions are in fact more stable financial institutions. A whole array of food-based movements is emerging. Farmers markets, consumer producer cooperatives, community supported agriculture, edible schoolyards, slow food, permaculture and urban gardens. If you shorten the distance between producers and consumers, you're cutting out your food miles, you're cutting out your emissions, your oil dependency, you're putting money straight back into the local economy where it's desperately needed. In Detroit, a city hit hard by the collapsing car industry, 
a focus on local food is helping people regain control over their own lives. So any and everybody can eat, but the only thing we ask is, come get dirty. If you right. see a weed, pick a weed, and you can always eat. Yeah, I mean, people are looking for the garden. See the tomatoes over there looking good. Can I get a couple of those? Yeah, man, come on. And our research has shown again and again and again that biodiverse small farms using ecological inputs produce three to five times more food than industrial monocultures. All I need is a complete integrated farm of one acre. To feed, I can feed 20 people. We don't need agriculture scientists, we don't need ag ivory seeds, we don't need GM, we don't need anything. We just need to be left alone to do our farming. We need to get back to basics to see what our real energy needs are. Do we really need the stuff that the consumer culture is foisting on us? And couldn't most of our real needs for clothing and housing, for food and drink, be produced far closer to home? If we cut out the outrageous waste inherent in the current system, we'd be able to meet a far higher proportion of our energy requirements from decentralized renewable sources. The wide range of renewable energy technologies, small, medium, large scale, will pound for pound, dollar for dollar, yen for yen, give you between two and four times as many jobs as the kind of centralized, old-fashioned energy technologies we've got at the moment. There's a win, win, win. In eco-villages and transition towns, people are working to rebuild their economies from the ground up by favoring local production for local needs over long-distance trade. Bringing the economy home back to the local level isn't about sacrifice. It's not about returning to the dark ages and asking people to do things they wouldn't want to do. On the contrary, it's about enriching our lives. When we localize, we give our children role models and I think a standard that they can live by that affirms them and affirms who they are in society. Rediscovering the values of community and mutual caring, that's where the real uh, happiness, the real well-being lies. Consumerism has got us weighed down with carbon chains and I suppose the message would be break your carbon chains, be free, have a better quality of life. The wonderful thing is that as we decrease the scale of economic activity we actually increase our own well-being. That's because at the deepest level, localization is about connection. It's about re-establishing our sense of interdependence with others and with the natural world. And this connection is a fundamental human need.